Tomorrow, as a part of our history, September 24th, is the 50th anniversary of the release of the Warren Commission findings. On November 29, 1963, one week after the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, President Lyndon Johnson announced that he had appointed a special commission to investigate the murder. The seven-man commission, led by Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, included two senators, two congressmen, including Gerald R. Ford, a former head of the CIA, and a former head of the World Bank. It was a commission of eminent and well-trusted leaders, but much, if not most, of the hard work of investigating the assassination was done by the commission's 23 staff lawyers. That group included our speaker tonight, Howard Willens, then a 32-year-old Justice Department lawyer who was one of three attorneys supervising the investigation. Tonight, we are honored to have Mr. Willens with us at, to provide an insider's account of the day-to-day -day operations of the Warren Commission, about the release of the findings in September 1964, and why he remains one of the most vigorous public defenders 50 years later. Howard Willens is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Michigan with a BA degree in political science. And today and this evening, it's Old Home Week with several of his former classmates coming to greet him. He received his law degree from Yale where he was an editor of the Yale Law Review or Yale Law Journal. He began his career in the firm of Kirkland Ellis in Washington, DC, and then was appointed Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the US Department of Justice. In 1963, he was appointed an assistant counsel to the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, known unofficially as the Warren Commission. Later, he served as executive director of the President's Commission on Crime in the District of Columbia, and then became a partner in the law firm of Wilmer Cutler and Pickering. There, his practice included litigation in federal and state courts, arbitration, and appellate work. Today, Mr. Willens continues to practice law as a managing director of Wilsey in Washington, DC. Of the many books written about the Kennedy assassination, our speaker's book, published in 2013, is the only one written about the commission by someone who was part of the management team that supervised the largest criminal investigation ever conducted in the United States. His book has received high praise from many sources, including from the nation's foremost prosecutor, Vincent Bugliosi, who published his own voluminous volume about the assassination in 20, 2007. And I want to show you, this is the Bugliosi book. <laughs> in contrast, however, in this jewel of a book we're discussing tonight, you notice how the real story is told by someone who's there in much more compact fashion. But Bugliosi said, finally, Willen's book is the much needed book on the Warren Commission. While the rest of us who have written about the commission were only peeking in, Howard Willens was there, a principal architect of the very history we could only write about. Now with his precise and very discerning pen, he has written an unimpeachable authority about what actually happened. Please join me in welcoming Howard and his wife Deanna back to the University of Michigan and to the Ford Library. Thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Elaine, for that gracious uh, introduction. And it's always a pleasure to come back to Ann Arbor, even when the football team is not doing very well. Uh, uh, today, uh, I will be talking, uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, about our experiences uh, on the Warren Commission uh, when we were charged with investigating the assassination of, of President Kennedy. Of all the people that were shocked and staggered and fearful at the time of this event, and I'm sure there are many in the room who were, we should think for a moment about Lyndon Johnson, who under these circumstances ascended to the, the responsibilities, the duties of the presidency of the United States. And the first thing he did was to call Jagger Hoover and say, please undertake a complete investigation of all the facts of relating uh, uh, to this assassination. The president hoped uh, that the uh, thorough investigation that he, that he anticipated from the FBI would provide the facts on which any prosecution of, of Lee Harvey Oswald and any associates or other assassins would be helped by, by that, 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 that evidence. He had to re-examine the situation, however, uh, on two days later 
uh, when Jack Ruby killed uh, 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 Lee Harvey uh, Oswald under the most unspeakable of circumstances in the basement of the Dallas Police Department, surrounded by policemen uh, and, and, and the press. Uh, Ruby jumps forward out of the crowd, fires one shot into the stomach, which is not usually a fatal shot, I'm told by my son, the doctor. Uh, and uh, uh, at that point, uh, Johnson had to uh, reconsider the facts as to how to handle uh, this public crisis. With Oswald dead, there would be no trial of Oswald and his associates. That has, has been the case in the three previous examples of presidential assassinations in the United States. How then were the facts uh, to be developed in a way that might uh, gender some degree of public uh, acceptance and put the conspiracy theories which are already mounting and with the hour uh, to rest if that ever could be done. So he decided that he had to appoint a presidential commission in order to uh, uh, delay, if not defer, uh, for, for an, uh, a long period, the kind of competing investigations that were being considered uh, by the state of Texas, the District of Dallas, and committee members in both the House and the Senate who were eager uh, to conduct hearings with respect to the assassination of the president and the subsequent murder of the alleged uh, uh, assassin. As you can imagine, four investigative bodies seeking access to the same witnesses, uh, the, the same uh, physical evidence, uh, uh, and, and competing for headlines uh, would have been a, a truly t uh, chaotic uh, experience uh, in the United States. So uh, President Johnson uh, uh, re re rejected his previous uh, conclusion that the matter should be left to Texas, and he appointed a, a commission. Uh, and of course, uh, Chief Justice Warren was among the most uh, respected people in public service in the United States uh, and uh, reluctantly uh, agreed to assume uh, uh, this duty. Uh, the, the Chief Justice knew that on two previous occasions when acting justices were asked to do public jobs, like prosecute criminals at the Nuremberg or investigate Pearl Harbor, uh, that the appointment and use of justices in those non-judicial assignments uh, had proved to be uh, divisive uh, within the court. So he was reluctant to take the job. He turned it down once uh, when it was offered by the Deputy Attorney General and the Solicitor General, uh, but LBJ uh, persuaded him otherwise. Uh, the President wanted to have a substantial congressional representation uh, on the commission for two very obvious reasons. First of all, if you had leading members of, 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 of Congress, uh, uh, on, on the panel, uh, it would ensure uh, that their brethren back in the House and the Senate uh, would not conduct investigations during the work uh, of, of the Warren Commission. And secondly, it was hoped that having men of this stature and experience and judgment, uh, uh, that the, the final uh, result or uh, recommendations of the commission would uh, win uh, acceptance. Uh, three of these four uh, members of Congress uh, quickly acceded to LBJ's uh, request uh, Senator Russell uh, turned him down flat. Senator Russell and, and, and Johnson uh, were uh, uh, close colleagues in the Senate. As his biographer, uh, uh, LBJ's biographer, has said recently, uh, they agree on everything except race. In any event, uh, Senator Russell was a mentor uh, to uh, uh, now President Johnson and said that he detested Chief Justice Warren, he abhorred the Chief Justice's liberal opinions, and he could not abide working with such a liberal, misguided uh, figure in, in American jurisprudence. Uh, President Johnson uh, pleaded in terms of their long personal relationship. He, he invoked his loyalty uh, requirements. Uh, he invoked the public interest in having the senator serve on the panel, and Senator Russell was adamant. And finally, Johnson uh, said, uh, 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 Mr. Senator, uh, I'm sorry, you must serve. I have already announced it to the press. Uh, <laughs> So in addition to these uh, members, there were two outstanding members of the establishment, John McCloy, uh, with many diverse uh, uh, credits uh, in his background, and then Alan Dulles, who had recently served uh, as uh, head of the CIA, uh, but resigned uh, amicably after many years, among other reasons, because of the failure of CIA policy with respect to the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion of, 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 of Cuba that had been sponsored uh, by uh, the, CIA, the CIA. The members of the commission had two, two immediate uh, uh, assignments, and they met for three times in December of 1963. 
uh, they, first they had to decide generally what their function was. Were they going to review reports from the federal government agencies, the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, simply review those and improve or modify or amend and then endorse conclusions from those investigative agencies, or were they going to conduct their own investigation to produce the facts on which they would make their own independent judgment? And this, they did decide, based on their early discussions and review of some of the preliminary reports coming to them from the agencies, that the agency work was neither uh, complete, uh, accurate, or useful. Uh, so they committed themselves to a separate investigation, and to that extent, they needed to have a staff. And so one of the first decisions uh, 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 they, they made uh, was to hire, as, as, as general counsel, J. Lee Rankin, who had served for eight years in the Justice Department under President Eisenhower. He had at first served as head of the Office of Legal Counsel, a challenging assignment uh, that one participant in this audience also served uh, for a while in, in later years. Uh, and then he became Solicitor General of the United States who argued regularly before the Supreme Court. In that capacity, he became known to the Chief Justice. Uh, uh, and uh, in part, it was, as my wife has commented, because Rankin was often arguing for positions that the Chief Justice approved of. Uh, and in any event, he was widely respected and took on, uh, on, on, on this duty. The first three meetings of, of the commission were attended uh, by acting Attorney General uh, uh, Nicholas uh, uh, Katzenbach. He was not officially acting, but he was in fact acting because Robert Kennedy uh, uh, withdrew from any uh, active participation in the department with respect to the investigation of the assassination of his brother. So Nick Katzenbach was invited by the commission to attend their first meetings. He made it clear, however, that the Department of Justice, as a prosecuting entity, uh, had no further responsibilities in this matter. It was up to the Warren Commission to decide how to conduct the investigation and what conclusions uh, uh, to reach. Apparently, at the last meeting on December 16th, after Rankin had attended for the first time to meet his new client, uh, uh, Nick Katzenbach said that he thought he could find a warm body among the 5,000 lawyers in the department who could be of assistance uh, in setting up the commission staff and organization. I, I was the warm body who was volunteered uh, by Nick Katzenbach. Uh, luck does play a, an important role in one's career, and this was one of those uh, uh, assignments that, of course, no young lawyer or, or aged lawyer uh, could, uh, could, could resist. And so when I showed up at work on December 17, 1963, I was called into the office of my boss, the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division, Jack Miller, and, and told that I had been volunteered, would I accept the assignment? I told Jack that, of course, I would accept the assignment. Having been in the military, I knew what volunteering meant uh, <laughs> as an enlisted man. Uh, to, let's make that clear. And so I got my hair cut, and I went up to visit with uh, J. Lee Rankin uh, and, and the, chief, uh, the Chief Justice. The Chief Justice was as impressive as his picture shows, and he made clear in this initial interview with me that he would welcome my assistance in getting the organization of the commission uh, put in place, but he wanted to make it clear that he wanted to have lawyers working on the commission staff who were from outside the government, who were independent who would bring their backgrounds and their independent judgment to bear on these critical uh, factual and, and policy uh, issues. And so with that, uh, I said, of course, I would serve in whatever capacity he wished. And from that point on, I began to work on a full-time basis with uh, J. Lee Rankin, uh, who made it clear a couple weeks later that despite what the Attorney General, uh, well, what the Chief Justice had said, that uh, uh, Mr. Rankin would like to have me help him out on a full-time uh, basis, and I did that for the next uh, 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 nine, nine months. Uh, the next appointment was Norman Redlick, a pre professor of law at NYU, uh, who uh, uh, Lee Rankin had come to know uh, in, in uh, New York City, where Mr. Rankin went to practice law after leaving the Justice Department in 1961. Uh, uh, this picture is taken in later years when Norman became corporation counsel in the late 60s and early 70s and then became dean uh, of, of the NYU uh, uh, law school. And, and as it happened, uh, it, it became clear o over time that uh, uh, Lee Rankin was looking to uh, Norman and me uh, unofficially as his uh, deputies. We had no you know, different titles than the other assistant counsel 
Uh, but he was uh, asking me to help deal with the agencies and help uh, uh, move the paperwork around. I was the bureaucrat uh, on, on the staff, and Norman was there for special projects, the first of which was to prepare uh, for taking the testimony of Marina Oswald in early uh, of February. We had to have a plan of some kind, and based on work that had been done in the criminal division uh, uh, before I joined the, the staff, uh, we basically divided the, the, the work up into six areas. Uh, the first area would look at such matters as how did this, how did this trip uh, uh, come to be? What was the purpose of the trip? Who was going to attend? What kind of protective measures were in place? What were the obstacles that one had to deal with in terms of security? Uh, and then the events of, of the day in question, including the shots uh, uh, and the, uh, the treatment at the hospital, the president's death, uh, uh, and all the issues that arose from those uh, e events. Uh, the, the second uh, group, uh, looked at the alleged assassin, assassin, and there was no other suspect at the time, but it was made clear that the people looking at Oswald's implication were obliged also to look for associates, any evidence of, of rifles on the scene other than uh, his rifle. In other words, develop uh, the case uh, with a view toward examining whether uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was the assassin, or was he one of several assassins, and, and, and provide the uh, factual basis on which the commission could uh, make its judgments. Um, the, the, the third uh, uh, area was to look closely at Oswald's background with two, two basic questions in mind. The first was, did he have any contacts uh, uh, in the year or two preceding uh, uh, the assassination or during his defection to the Soviet Union? Uh, did he have relationships uh, uh, that gave any reason to uh, believe that there may have been a conspiracy uh, where he was the front man to commit the assassination? And the second reason uh, uh, for this group uh, was to look for motive. Why did he do this? So was it because he was a Marxist? Was it because his wife had rebuffed him the night before? Uh, and, and, or were there personal uh, deficiencies in his background, intellect, and emotional uh, state uh, that caused him to uh, engage in this horrific uh, 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 deed in order to fix his place in, in history? The, the, the fourth uh, group looked at Oswald's foreign relationships, particularly in the Soviet Union, for the two-plus years he was there as a defector, and secondly, his efforts to go to uh, Cuba uh, only about seven weeks before the assassination. He went to Mexico, uh, went to the Cuban uh, embassy and the Soviet embassy trying to get a visa to go uh, through Cuba to the Soviet Union, and he was denied uh, uh, that uh, uh, visa uh, by Cuba uh, until he got a, a visa from Soviet Union, which he never did uh, get before the assassination. Uh, the, the, the fifth area looked at Ruby with the same two objectives in mind. Uh, one, was there a conspiracy that uh, brought uh, 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 Ruby into the basement of the police department at that critical moment when Oswald was being uh, moved from upstairs uh, to the vehicle that would take him to a more secure uh, prison? And secondly, uh, why, did, why did Ruby uh, 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 commit uh, uh, this act? The, the last group looked at the only forward-looking object on our agenda, and that was uh, how did the Secret Service per, uh, perform in this, in, in this uh, example? Uh, were there deficiencies in policies or practices evidenced by the assassination in Dallas that required some movement of the Secret Service responsibility from the Department of Treasury, where it had been since the Civil War times? Uh, uh, to another agency, uh, or, or, or were there uh, changes in their procedures and, and uh, uh, protective policies that the commission should address in an effort to reduce the probabilities of this uh, happening uh, uh, again? And, and when the work was done in each of these areas by a senior lawyer and a junior lawyer were assigned to each of these areas, they produced memos, they produced temporary drafts, they produced issues for the commission to act upon, and the, the essence of that work and the conclusions that the commission reached on, on, on those investigations found their way into the, uh, uh, the final report. Uh, Chief Justice did meet with the full staff uh, uh, in January. It was a memorable meeting. Uh, again, the lawyers were, were coming together for the first time. We managed to hire uh, 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 about a, a dozen, 14 uh, lawyers very, very promptly, including several very senior lawyers and, and a, a, a younger group. Uh, and the Chief Justice made it clear uh, that he had taken this job reluctantly, but he was determined to do an honest and, and complete job. And it, 
anyone who looks at the facts of the Chief Justice's involvement can clearly see how wrong it is for some of the contemporary critics of the commission, and including people with the journalistic credit credentials of the first rate, to say that, that Warren's management of this was a disaster, that he never wanted to conduct a thorough investigation, and he pro prohibited the staff from conducting investigative leads in certain directions that might have led to a conspiracy. That is simply false. As I will say, the Chief Justice took a personal and intense interest in this investigation at the same time that he participated fully in running uh, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, there were many of the physical uh, items that were already uh, uh, known to us and had been reported on by the FBI. Uh, the, uh, there were three cartridges discovered in, in the uh, sixth floor of the depository. Uh, the, the nearly whole bullet from Connolly uh, uh, was found uh, in, in the hospital on his stretcher. There were five fragments uh, 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 in, in the car. There was evidence of two uh, bullets. Uh, 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 that hit the two men in the uh, vehicle, and that uh, opened up several important questions that have become uh, controversial uh, o o o over the years. Uh, Oswald had that picture taken uh, uh, by his wife, showing both the revolver and the rifle that he, he owned. This was a depository uh, through which the, uh, uh, by which the, the uh, motorcade passed. The data, the timing of the motorcade and the location of the motorcade was made public only three days before the assassination on, 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 on December 19. It was published in the paper. Oswald could have learned about it either on the 19th or more likely on the morning of, of the 20th to learn that the motorcade was going to pass directly underneath uh, uh, the uh, uh, depository. He had secured a position in the depository some six or seven weeks earlier because a friend of his, his wife's uh, uh, knew someone who was working uh, in the depository who told her that there were two vacancies uh, that Lee Harvey Oswald might interview for, and he did uh, interview, and he did get the job and started work on October 15 or October uh, 16. So there was physical evidence there uh, because the next to the, uh, in the depository, in the corner from which the shots were believed to have come, there were a stack of, 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 of books, uh, uh, packages. This was a book depository. They stored books in cartons, and then they went into the cartons to produce books to be shipped out to schools and other uh, uh, other institutions. Uh, Oswald's fingerprints were uh, found uh, in, in in this uh, area. There, the question was, how did the how did the rifle get into the building? And uh, as I mentioned. Uh, 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 Lee Harvey Oswald li lived in a rooming house in Dallas, but his wife Marina and now two young daughters uh, lived with a, a friend uh, named Ruth Payne, who was part of a Russian-speaking group uh, in of the Fort Worth, Dallas uh, uh, area, who, who immediately embraced uh, uh, Marina when she showed up, uh, being uh, uh, engaged in what was e readily perceived as an unhappy marriage and unable to speak English, they took her uh, under uh, their wing collectively, and Ruth Payne offered a, a house in which Marina and the two daughters uh, could live. Uh, Oswald typically uh, uh, visited uh, the, uh, his wife uh, 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 over the weekend, uh, and he had his neighbor, who was the one who knew about the job that he ultimately took, who drove Oswald to work regularly on Monday morning, and then brought him home on Friday afternoon for the weekend with his family. Uh, but uh, on Thursday, the 21st, uh, uh, Oswald asked Fraser if uh, he could ride home on Thursday night uh, with Fraser and return the next morning. And Fraser agreed. And when Oswald turned up the next morning, he had a brown uh, a package, carrying a package which he told uh, uh, Fraser and Fraser's sister, who saw the package, that he needed curtain rods for his rooming house uh, uh, apartment. And, and that proved to be a false uh, once the, the bag was discovered and examined. Uh, it was uh, shown to have uh, evidence of, uh, of being the place in which the rifle was contained and carried, carried in, into the building. Uh, now, the, the, w one of the other pieces of physical evidence that was of importance uh, was the, the, the pistol. Uh, which was found on, on Oswald's uh, a person when they arrested him in, in, in the theater. And he uh, uh, had, after the uh, assassination, Oswald had left the depository. He was the only, only employee of the depository who left after the assassination. Uh, he explained later that he left because he thought there would be. 
that there would be no, no more work, there, there would be no more work to be done uh, that day. He had no obvious uh, uh, plan for uh, escape. Uh, he took a bus that actually took him back toward the depository. Then he got out of the bus, uh, uh, w got a taxi cab to take him to uh, deposit him at his house, but he didn't stop in front of his house. He had the driver stop uh, a block away. He went into the house, uh, changed his jackets, and got his revolver. He had only $13 in his pocket. He had left $170 and his ring, a wedding ring, on the dresser in his wife's bedroom uh, back in Ir Irving, Texas. So there was no evidence uh, of a plan to uh, escape. Uh, and there is a, uh, we didn't know where exactly Oswald was going to uh, go, uh, but uh, we did uh, plot out a, a, a route uh, that took him in a way where he eventually was stopped by a patrolman named Tippett. There were eyewitnesses to this assassination, seven or eight people who saw the rifle extended from the sixth floor of the depository, and some of them saw it actually being shot, and a few of them saw actually a, a slight white man uh, uh, at using the rifle. Not one law enforcement per person on the scene uh, saw the window from which the, uh, the shots uh, uh, were directed at uh, the presidential uh, uh, l l l l l limousine. So the, uh, the, the physical evidence that mounted uh, uh, w was very substantial, uh, but the most important uh, part of the commission's investigation was to secure sworn testimony. Uh, the commission uh, heard from 94 witnesses uh, and the lawyers involved were given the authority to take sworn depositions uh, from witnesses, and they took 395 witnesses. The total number of witnesses examined by the commission was 552, and it was based on that sworn testimony uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, the commission reached it, its conclusions. The, 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 the first of the, the witnesses uh, was Marina Oswald, and of course the, the key issues there were, well, was she a Soviet agent? to begin with. And secondly, did she know uh, about her husband's intentions with respect to the president? And did she, did she play any ro uh, role in aiding and abetting his, his attempt uh, to kill the president? In fact, she had already lied to the investigative agencies on two important issues. She denied that she knew that her husband was going, went to Mexico to seek a visa to go to Cuba uh, some seven weeks before the assassination. She also denied that she knew uh, that her husband had tried to kill retired General Edwin Walker in Dallas six months before the assassination in April. So the question before the commission and the staff and everyone who was interested in this critical witness was, well, will she now tell the truth? And, and, and how will she uh, act under uh, cross-examination by members of the, of, of the commission? She appeared on three occasions before the commission members, and she was the subject of one deposition. There was a lot of controversy among the staff and the members of the commission as to how vigorously uh, Marina Oswald was questioned, and some complained she wasn't being questioned uh, uh, with sufficient rigor. Uh, but by the time the investigation was over, I think most of the, the members of the commission and the staff were satisfied that she was not an agent. She really uh, had played no role uh, in in the planning of the assassination. They had a very difficult marriage. She was asked by Senator Russell, well, was he a good husband or a bad husband? And she responded, well, he was a good husband when he helped wash the dishes and take care of the children, and he was a bad husband when he beat me. I think you can find general agreement in this group that that would be a fair definition of a good and a bad husband. The, the, the list of people examined here does include a cab, cabinet members, and in particular, a, a Congressman Ford was particularly interested in the State Department's role uh, in, in this set of events. Uh, Oswald had defected, as I mentioned earlier, but in early 1962, he, uh, after he married uh, Marina, he announced that he wanted to uh, re uh, return, and he got a passport, and he did return to the United States. And uh, future President Ford could not understand why uh, the embassy in, in, the, in, in, in the Soviet Union refused to accept Oswald's re renunciation of his U.S. citizenship when he appeared there uh, sometime back in, in, in 1961, in the fall of 1961. 
He said, here, Oswald walked into the embassy on a Saturday, said, I no longer uh, believe in the United States. I want to renounce my citizenship. I want to become a citizen of the Soviet Union. And the officials of the State Department uh, uh, refused to act uh, uh, in a timely fashion because he showed up on a Saturday when they were not officially on duty, as opposed to next Monday. Uh, and he had not filled out the proper forms. So if he had to come in on Monday and filled out the proper forms, they would have accepted the renunciation of his citizenship. He would never have gotten his passport back uh, a few years later, uh, and uh, uh, history uh, would be written in a very different uh, uh, way. Uh, there, there were, as I mentioned, uh, the eyewitnesses who saw uh, Oswald or a man firing a rifle the, the initial B here marks a window on the fifth floor where there were three employees of the uh, depository who heard the shots f fired right above them and, and they heard the cartridges fall on the floor. And so they were very powerful witnesses to support the fact that the, the shots had in fact come from the sixth floor from the rifle found there uh, that was later discovered to belong to, uh, to Oswald. So by the time the investigation was over, every one of the seven members of the commission went up to the fifth floor, and some federal agent went up to the sixth floor and dropped three cartridge shells on the floor. And yes, it, indeed, all seven members of the commission agreed uh, that they could be heard, and that therefore the testimony of these three employees uh, should be uh, weighed, uh, should weigh he heavily in, in, the, in their calculations. As I said, when, uh, we don't know where Oswald was going after he left his house, but uh, what we did here, uh, we, we traced the route. The, the, the dotted line shows what the route that we assumed. The, the, the solid portion of the route is the portion where we had actually eyewitnesses who saw the confrontation uh, and shooting of Officer uh, Tippett and then watched, they saw the assassin uh, uh, walk away uh, following the path here and, and where it says jacket. Oswald threw down his jacket that he had taken from his rooming house, and then he proceeded several blocks later to enter a movie theater without a ticket, heaven forbid, uh, and he was uh, seen as so doing, the police were called, and he was uh, apprehended uh, as the suspect for killing Tippett. There was no uh, uh, understanding at the time until he was back at the police department that he also uh, was the suspect uh, for the assassination of, 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 of the president. So in addition to the physical evidence, the sworn testimony, uh, there, all sorts of expertise was called into place uh, here in, in finding that the three cartridges had, had in fact, be fired uh, uh, from the, the rifle. Uh, and, and the same was true of the nearly whole bullet and the larger fragments that were large enough to be subjected to uh, a ballistics examination. The problem was that the FBI report originally said three shots were fired. The first shot hit the president in the back, uh, but a, the nearly whole bullet, the FBI said, fell, didn't transverse the body, fell out of the president's back because they didn't see any exit wound on the front of, 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 of the president. And they said the second bullet hit uh, Governor Connolly and caused the three wounds that he suffered, and the third and fatal shot hit the president in, in the head. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there was evidence only of two bullets, in fact, hitting the occupants. And so the, one of the major issues in, for the staff and the investigative agencies uh, in the early months of the commission's work, January, February, March, was to figure out, uh, using the Sapruder film, uh, exactly uh, what shots a uh, hit either of the occupants in the car. And there were a lot of, uh, it was, to some extent it was quite subjective because uh, th this was a very primitive camera. I mean, it was a good camera for those days. Uh, but it was because of some of the obstacles, uh, a, a, a tree, uh, a roadside stands, it was, you could not see the car uh, and its occupants for the entire period of time during which the three shots were fired. So there, people made assumptions as to when the president was reacting uh, to the shot that hit his back, but did, contrary to the FBI, exit from his throat. But the, the treating physicians in, in Dallas, uh, uh, first of all, never examined the president's back, and they saw this wound in the throat, which they thought could have been either an exit or an entry wound, but they enlarged it as part of their efforts to resuscitate uh, of the president. Uh, so when the autopsy doctors learned what the Parkland Dallas doctors had done 
it was made clear within 24 hours that in fact the bullet that entered the president's back, uh, top of his back, did exit from his throat. And then the question was, where did it go? And there was no uh, physical evidence of a bullet hitting the inside uh, of, 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 of the presidential vehicle. And it was concluded by all the medical and other evidence that the shots came from above and behind. So the question was, where did that bullet go? And it's from that uh, examination that the staff developed the theory, uh, later derided as the magic bullet, that the bullet that exited the president's throat hit Governor Connolly, who was in a jump seat seated below and a little bit to the left of, 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 the, uh, of the president. Uh, so in order to examine that theory, uh, which of course was quite controversial, uh, uh, the, uh, we conducted a, 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 re a reenactment uh, that, that produced a, an FBI agent, a very competent uh, agent uh, here who was instrumental in helping us on, on, on these, these analyses, who, who had Oswald's rifle with a, with a, a camera on, on the top, and he was looking uh, down at a car uh, uh, identical to the presidential uh, a limousine, and you can see uh, that the figure in front representing the governor is seated uh, slightly to the, uh, he's not seated directly in front of the, uh, uh, the president, it's probably the best way to say it. He was, he was seated about six to inches away from the side of the car where the president was seat was right against the side uh, of, of the limousine. And so the staff examined it, and here's one of our, our staff members who became a five-time senator from uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter. And, and Ireland was uh, 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 one of the lawyers in charge of this particular uh, uh, analysis. Uh, and on, on the basis of this reenactment uh, and then uh, other uh, evidence as well that the, the staff proposed uh, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that two bullets hit, the one bullet causing the president's injury to his, his back and throat and injuring Governor Connolly, and the second bullet uh, uh, hitting the, the, the president in, in, in the head. So one way to look at these wounds, there were specialists in the Army, uh, uh, actually, who, who, who could use animal flesh and ex examine the nature of wounds, determine what the trajectory uh, of, the, of the bullet was that caused the wounds, uh, deliberate whether the bullet had been previously hit any other obstacles, so that it was, had lost a, a velocity, and the nature of the wound would be different. So it's a, a science that obviously is of great interest to the Defense Department, and we, uh, we asked these experts to conduct the appropriate examination uh, based on the autopsy report, the nature of the wounds, uh, to answer uh, to several basic questions. But uh, the first is, well, where did the bullets come from? What was the trajectory? And all the pathologists who looked at this at the time and later confirmed that the bullets came from above and behind, um, uh, as evidence here. And then the, the, the more controversial issue uh, is uh, whether the one, one bullet did hit a, a governor. All the wounds that Governor Connolly uh, suffered, there was a wound to his back, his chest, then it hit his wrist, and it, it ended up with, in, in a minor wound in his thigh, and that was the nearly whole bullet that lost sufficient grains, but did, did, did commit these injuries. So the question was whether the bullet that hit Connolly was the same bullet that exited the president's throat. And, and the, the, the evidence, uh, as the evidence mounted, it seemed to the staff and the majority of the commission uh, that the, uh, the single bullet theory was the only logical way uh, to explain the nature of the wounds uh, and the absence of any other evidence in the car that the bullet that exited the president's throat hit any part of the, uh, of the interior of the vehicle. We had handwriting experts look at some of the critical documents involved to confirm that Oswald had in fact ordered uh, the rifle and, and the revolver. And also, uh, after he made the attempt to uh, kill uh, uh, General, retired General Walker, he actually had written a note uh, uh, for his wife uh, anticipating that he might either be killed or, uh, as a result of this attempt or apprehended. And he told her what jail he would be likely to be held in. He, uh, what bills needed to be paid, uh, money that he had left uh, for tho that, those domestic purposes. Uh, and we had ever, those notes were not completely destroyed. And we had the pictures that you've seen and, and the notes uh, that, that did, did tend to confirm uh, uh, that Oswald did have a capacity to take human life, and he had tried to do so unsuccessfully uh, six months before the assassination uh, of, of President Kennedy. 
There's a lot of talk about Oswald being an agent of one agency or another, or perhaps a foreign government. And the thought was, well, where do you get the money? I mean, if he was an agent, uh, would, would he have been compensated for his uh, uh, services to assassinate the president? Or, or was he doing it uh, you know, out of ch charitable in instincts? And we hired some FBI agents, uh, I'm sorry, uh, IRS agents, uh, to look at the money that uh, he expended and earned uh, during the period from the time he returned to the United States in about June of 1962 until the assassination in November of 1963. And the uh, agents estimated that he would have $164.10 in his possession at the time of the assassination. In fact, he left $170 uh, at home with his wife and he had $13.87 in his pocket. So there was a controversy within the staff as to whether this was so precise and so close to being accurate, completely accurate, that it would not be believed. And, and, and some of us argue just the contrary, that this, that's the purpose of this kind of a financial uh, examination. And, and the key thing is that there was simply no spare cash. I mean, there was no income here that he was secreting uh, away uh, or for his, his retirement or trips to Cuba or, 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 or whatever. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, the, the, this uh, effort to kill Walker uh, did, did evidence uh, uh, that he planned it very carefully. He had no associates at all, no escape plan, and he left, these, uh, he, he left these notes. The local police department had not solved this uh, uh, murder attempt. Uh, there was a mangled bullet that they uh, didn't know had any uh, uh, evidence as to where it came from. No one had seen Oswald commit the task or uh, the, uh, uh, the attempted assassination. And so it was only after the assassination of President Kennedy uh, and these uh, materials in Marina's possession came to light uh, that the local law enforcement people realized that Oswald uh, had been the, uh, 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 the, the man who tried to kill a, a, a General, G General Walker. Uh, Ruby wanted very much to have a polygraph examination. Uh, uh, the Chief Justice uh, went down to take his testimony uh, a company with, with, with Ireland, and uh, uh, Ruby had consistently said uh, that he had no associates, uh, he had no, had no plans to kill uh, 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 Oswald, it was, uh, he was caught up in the moment. Uh, he always carried a revolver with him, as well as thousands of dollars of cash. He was running two uh, uh, strip clubs uh, in Dallas, had, was well known in the police department. Uh, there never was a clear indication of how he got into the basement. Uh, he certainly, there was no policeman that said they saw him going into the basement, of course, uh, but it clearly was a, a disastrous failure of, of police security in trying to move Oswald from one jail uh, to another. Uh, eventually, uh, the uh, uh, Chief Justice did agree to uh, having Ruby take a, a polygraph uh, 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 examination. It, it, it was, it, it showed no evidence of deception, uh, but the commission did not rely on the polygraph examination uh, despite its apparent you know, validity because you know, they all knew and, and Hoover advised they should not rely because it still was not a completely proven investigative uh, 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 technique. So one of the important things that we developed in investigating Ruby for the two months before the assassination, the goal in Area 5 was to find out who Ruby was talking to in person, in phone, what, where was he traveling? Who were his associates? Was there anything in the two months preceding the assassination that suggested that Ruby uh, was, being, uh, uh, was being hired or, or would have been receptive to a proposal that he go into the police department and kill uh, Oswald? And so what, what we developed from our facts was that we looked very carefully at what Ruby did on Sunday morning, the, the, the 24th. And Ruby lived with a man named George Senator, and Ru Ruby uh, uh, gets up at around 8.30 and 9 o'clock. George had, had left, and uh, Ruby had uh, uh, breakfast. Uh, he got a call from his housekeeper who asked whether she should come, as she usually did on Sundays, to clean the apartment. And uh, I just learned recently that, in fact, uh, the, the housekeeper thought that Ruby sounded so strange that she decided she didn't want to go do her job uh, that day. She was going to call later in the afternoon and see whether he wanted her to come. So then he got a call from uh, an employee uh, who lived in Fort Worth but was working at one of his clubs in Dallas. 
uh, her, her name was Little Lynn, uh, and uh, she called to say that she had showed up on Saturday uh, evening, not knowing that the nightclub had been uh, uh, canceled for the evening because out of deference to the president's ass uh, assassination. Uh, and she said she needed $25 for rent and to, for food. And so Ruby said that he would go send her $25 by money order, Western Union. So he gets in the car a half an hour or so later. He has seven dogs that he regards as members of his family. He, he took his favorite, favorite dog named Sherba, uh, gets in the car with his cash, with his revolver, and heads for Western Union. He waits patiently in line at Western Union. Uh, he buys a money order for $25 to send to Little Lynn. Uh, at 11.17, there's a stamped receipt. Uh, he, he leaves uh, the, uh, the Union, uh, Western Union office, looks down the street, a block away is the police department, and he sees a crowd. Now Ruby and everyone else in the world knew, through a public announcement, that Oswald was going to be moved no later than 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So everyone who wanted to see the movement of Oswald and take pictures, you know, the, uh, was going to be there at 10 o'clock. But Ruby sees there's still a crowd, so he said, well, maybe he hasn't moved. So he went on to see what was uh, going on, walks down the, uh, the, the back of the driveway where he was going to be removed, and shoots Oswald uh, uh, four minutes after the receipt at the Western Union. So in, in short, if, I, if Ruby had any plan to shoot Oswald, he would have been there before 10 o'clock, and he would have been nowhere near the police department if his stripper hadn't called and asked for $25. Now, you know, and so all, the, all the, the, the rumors and suspicions about Ruby being hired by the mob to kill Oswald, who'd been hired by the mob, and then the, as Bill Yossi says, well, who was going to be hired to kill Ruby? I mean, so the, just the, the point is, if you look at the facts and analyze the probabilities uh, that a, a man of, of Ruby's background in, uh, uh, limitations uh, would have been part of any a plan, uh, one of the police department officials who testified before the commission, who knew Ruby very well, said, you know, if, if organized crime had hired uh, Ruby uh, to, to do this job, uh, you know, the personnel director should be fired. Uh, so, uh, so the commission had all, all this evidence before it that, that you see, uh, uh, and they had to uh, uh, take charge, and Warren was concerned that the staff was getting ahead of the commission. And most of you junior people who used to work for senior people know that's always the case. Uh, you know, the staff's always smarter than the commission. They always spend more time. And in any event, the Chief Justice was getting, getting concerned about this, and he called Lee Rankin and said, I want to come over on Wednesday and, and talk to you about where we go from here. And uh, uh, Lee Rankin, who was based in New York at that time, had to go back for family or professional reasons, and so he told Norman and me to meet with the Chief Justice. So Norman now is the senior, he's now 38 years old, I've now progressed to be 33 years old. There's progress here. And uh, so Warren comes over to meet us, and uh, he, he, he says that he wants the commission to make decisions on specific issues of fact. He doesn't want the staff proposing conclusions, he wants the commission making conclusions. So he hands us across the table a yellow page of legal paper on which he writes in his own handwriting 41 questions. The questions are very simple. At what time did the shots take place? How many shots were fired? Where'd they come from? Uh, what kind of wounds were suffered? And so forth and so on. And so he, he hands us across the table with, with great pride and he looks at Norman and me. He says, well, what do you think of my proposal? And I think uh, you can anticipate uh, that we were profuse in our admiration uh, uh, for the, the Chief Justice thoroughness, his uh, addiction to detail, uh, uh, and his eagerness to get the commission in the process of starting to make decisions. So in fact, uh, uh, these uh, uh, questions were put before uh, the commission at meetings in late June and early July, and almost all of them were questioned without any difficulty. And, uh, uh, except some of the major issues uh, relating to conspiracy uh, and, and the, the single bullet theory and a few others that, on which more, more evidence and work was being done and the commission wanted to reserve decision until, uh, uh, until later. Uh, of course, as I say here, the, the staff, of course, was not content with the 41. 
Uh, they en en enlarged it to 72. Uh, but in, in any event, it, it was, a, I think, a dramatic uh, uh, event in my experience in that the, the Chief Justice you know, was committed to, to, to this extent to get into the, the, the detail uh, to an extent I think some of his colleagues were not so eager to do. And then that, in fact, he was absolutely right that the commission had to make these decisions and then the, the staff could propose, you know, drafts as we did endlessly, drafts to explain the decisions and evaluate the evidence, provide all the footnotes uh, and do other uh, useful things that staffs uh, uh, can do. Uh, so the, uh, the conclusions are more or less uh, con put before you about Oswald fired three shots. We never, never did agree within the commission as to what shot missed. And in fact, our report makes it very clear. Uh, we have a paragraph about each shot. What's the probability that the first shot missed? And what are the, the pros and the cons and so forth and so on. The consensus today is a subsequent examination is that the first shot missed. And although you might say, as I think I probably thought at the time, well, that's the easiest shot because it was closer, it was closer to Oswald's sight in the window as the uh, 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 limousine uh, went down the road. But the fact is, when you think about it and look at it, the, 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 the vehicle was going across the window. It was a moving, a moving target, uh, which made it more difficult because once the car was going down this road, this incline toward the overpass, Oswald could rest his rifle on top of those cartons and he barely, didn't have to really move at all because he had a downward trajectory. And everyone who's handled a rifle who goes to the scene agrees that the rifle shots uh, were very easy, particularly with a, a scope at the distance uh, uh, in, in involved. So the conclusions uh, did, did affirm the, the uh, single bullet theory that he killed Tippett, that Ruby fired the shot, and there were no, no evidence of, of, uh, of conspirators. Uh, I'll come back to that. The, the last issue I have not mentioned, and that is that the, the commission did worry a good deal about the protective measures uh, that uh, had been in place. Uh, we had a bureaucratic conflict with the Secretary of the Treasury, a very talented Wall Street financier named uh, Thomas uh, Douglas uh, Dillon, who was Secretary of the Treasury at the time, uh, who basically did not want to give the commission the internal evaluation of how his agency had performed. And so we had to come at it in, in a rather circular way. We eventually learned enough uh, to conclude uh, that the Secret Service procedures in, were seriously deficient. And it was another case which you may not may uh, uh, provide for some reflection here. We found out for the first time during a hearing that uh, eight or 10 of the Secret Service people on the White House detail were out drinking the night before. And this was a clear, clear violation. That, that has happened again, you will remember. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that was clearly in violation uh, of, of the Secret Service regulations. And the Chief Justice uh, was very patient but very firm in talking to Rowley, called Chief Rowley, head of the Secret Service, about why didn't you sanction these individuals for violating the regulations? And he said, because it would mean that for all, uh, history would, would then assign to them and their families the responsibility for the assassination. And he didn't want to do that. So uh, Chief Justice didn't agree with that uh, 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 assessment. Uh, but the, the commission's report was critical uh, of, of the uh, uh, performance of the Secret Service. Uh, and, but they did not uh, see that they could achieve anything by simply moving it to another organization. And they did reach a, a conclusion that the FBI had known so much about Oswald, about his defection, about his return, about his, his, communi his communication with the uh, uh, Soviet embassy, uh, about his trip to Mexico City to try to get to Cuba and perhaps the Soviet Union, that he was a sufficiently questionable candidate that he sh they should have informed the Secret Service about him in advance of, of, of the motorcade. And Hoover testified under oath that that's preposterous. We had no responsibility to do that. We didn't think he had any capacity uh, to engage in, in, in a violent uh, act. So the point about the con uh, conspiracy uh, findings is that y y people are saying, well, you don't have no evidence. Y the commission could not say there was no conspiracy. The commission said uh, there was no credible evidence that produced by its investigation that uh, supported 
uh, the existence of a conspiracy, and, and, and they recognize that there would be subsequent uh, uh, in, in investigations. Uh, and, and there have been, have been many investigations of key issues that the commission uh, considered. There was a lot of complaint uh, that the commission failed to publish uh, the pictures of President Kennedy in, uh, in his injured form uh, uh, and did not produce the, make part of the public record uh, the x-rays that were taken of him at the time. The autopsy report was part of the public record. The autopsy doctors testified, uh, as did the Parkland hospitals. But there's a lot of controversy about the adequacy of the autopsy and whether, in fact, uh, the bullets did come from, from above and behind and so forth and so on. So uh, the Attorney General, uh, Ramsey Clark, in 1968, uh, decided to ask a panel of four pathologists to look at it. Uh, the materials, all the raw materials, they did, and they confirmed the conclusions reached uh, by the commission. The Rockefeller Commission, where the executive director was David Bellin, a member of the commission staff, a University of Michigan graduate. He was, ex and they looked at several specific allegations where it had been alleged that members of the CIA were either present in Dallas or had conspired uh, with the uh, 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 assassin, and all of those uh, were unsubstantiated. And they convened their own panel, a pathologist. Uh, 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 another four or five pathologists looked at the autopsy materials and reached the same uh, conclusion that the Clark Group had and that the commission had. The Senator Church Committee, was the first committee to disclose publicly uh, that the CIA had engaged uh, in a campaign over at least four years from 1960 through 1963 to assassinate Castro. And uh, no one from the CIA had informed uh, the commission uh, uh, staff and, and members, except for Dulles, uh, uh, about this activity. And the church committee also looked at the way in which the FBI and CIA had assisted the commission, and they concluded that both agencies had failed to give the Warren Commission access to all of their informants and expertise involving Cuban exiles, involving the, uh, uh, the assassination uh, plots. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the Senator Church, did specifically, uh, his committee went out of the way to say, we're not reinvestigating the assassination, but we, we find nothing uh, in our investigation indicate that there was a, a conspiracy, but we have concluded uh, that the uh, commission did not get the support from the federal agencies that President Johnson uh, had mandated uh, should uh, to be provided uh, 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 to the commission. So when we come to lies and admissions, uh, uh, omissions here, we see two very uh, memorable figures. Uh, uh, CIA Director Helms here testified before uh, the, the Church Committee and later on before another Congressional Committee I'll mention. Uh, and he basically said, I was not obliged to provide the Commission with information about the assassination plots because all I had to do was answer their questions. In other words, I sat down with this man on more than two or three occasions. And so uh, he's basically saying uh, he had no obligation to, to volunteer the information. If we had asked specifically, well, were you engaged in assassination plots directed at, at Castro, he, he suggested uh, under oath that, yes, he would have answered truthfully. Uh, of course, uh, I doubt that. Uh, so in any event, I mean, he was a very highly respected intelligence community, uh, uh, but he definitely uh, took a very strong uh, view that he was going to protect uh, those secret activities uh, uh, um, and, and keep them from coming out into the public domain for as long as possible. And that they managed to conceal this from public scrutiny until uh, 1976. As for uh, Jagger Hoover, he, he jauntily uh, entered the commission uh, room and testified under oath that uh, the FBI investigation of Oswald was impeccable, that was complete. There was no reason to report any information uh, to the uh, Secret Service in advance of the motorcade. Ten years later, we learned, we're no longer a commission or staff, we individuals learned that he lied. That in fact, within 10 days uh, of, of the uh, assassination, he'd asked for an internal review of the way in which his agency had investigated Oswald uh, in the months preceding the assassination. He got a report from an assistant director and he promptly disciplined uh, 17 officials and agents uh, of, of the FBI for failing to conduct an adequate investigation of Lee Harvey Oswald. And in one document, his handwriting is there on the top of the of a page, and it says, no one in their right mind could believe this man should not have been reported to the Secret Service. So the, the brazen nature of this 
autocrat, I mean, it is today beyond belief. Or one hopes it's beyond belief. And we uh, don't see it again. Uh, uh, so and now Hoover, uh, so Hoover's uh, deception, he died in 1972, uh, I believe. And it was only in 1975 and 76 that these uh, these FBI uh, uh, activities were, 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 were disclosed. So the, the investigations uh, went, on, went on further, uh, uh, and the House Select Committee was the only the government uh, uh, committee uh, appointed in, in 1970, worked in 77, 78, reported in early 1979. And this was the committee set up to reinvestigate the Kennedy assassination and the assassination of, of Reverend King. Uh, and they produced a draft final report in December of 1978 in which they agreed that Oswald was the sole shooter, and they agreed there was no evidence of a conspiracy uh, uh, based on eyewitness and, and other testimony. Um, and they agreed there was no scientific evidence to the contrary. Uh, but within two weeks, they, they, they changed their, their, their position. Uh, they accepted uh, uh, evidence from three experts that sound waves on a tape believed to reflect conversations uh, overheard by a policeman in the motorcade uh, reflected shots. Now, let me be clear about this. The tape, anyone listens to the tape, does not hear shots. What you see are 14 uh, evidences of uh, sound waves of a noise. And these three experts, after reenactment, said that they could testify with 95% certainty that three of those waves represented shots from the depository, and one represented a, a shot from the grassy knoll, which they could pinpoint within 10 yards of where it happened. So the, the staff, eager for a conspiracy finding and, and showing an enormous disrespect for their clients, in my opinion, um, persuaded seven of the 12 members of the committee to accept this acoustics evidence uh, and, and ignore the fact uh, 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 that there was no, there was no second uh, uh, shooter. And that, of course, gave new meaning and enthusiasm to the conspiracy uh, community that a government agency had uh, finally uh, come to uh, learn a uh, truth about the existence of a second shooter. After uh, Oliver Stone did his movie on JFK, uh, th there was a, a legislation uh, asking that all the available materials that hadn't been already produced uh, be supplied to the National Archives. They found no new evidence. Bugliosi, the book you saw, you saw the 1,600 pages. What you didn't see was the CD with 1,000 pages of endnotes. Uh, <laughs> it's an amazing piece of professional uh, 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 work, an extraordinary, extraordinary man. Uh, and although he took issue with some of our uh, work, he's firmly in agreement that we, we did reach the fine conclusions. Well, about the second shooter, uh, just to, to run, run through it very, very quickly, uh, there, 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 there were ear witnesses. There were, only, there were only out of 178 people who testified as to what they heard. There were only four people that heard shots from two different locations. Every, there were a great number that heard from the depository. An equal number heard it from the grassy knoll. Some heard it from the railroad overpass. So there were only a, just a, a handful of witnesses that heard uh, shots from, 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 two, from two sources. The three audio experts uh, supported the, the existence of a second shooter. The uh, National Academy of Sciences appointed a commission of 12 physicists headed by a Nobel Prize winner from Harvard who looked at the tape, analyzed the sound waves, other evidence, and concluded that the sound waves on which the three experts had relied in fact reflected noises that took place 60 seconds after the assassination. So the earlier report was, shall we say, junk science uh, in the full meaning of the term. It was very very damaging uh, to the, the history, I think. Uh, uh, and the staff uh, council who was a sponsor of this uh, is appearing at the Conspiracy Council uh, uh, Committee uh, uh, convention this weekend in, in Washington. And he will still be asserting that there was a second uh, 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 a shooter. Uh, so the other evidence of a second shooter comes from the fact that in the Zapruder film and the, the frames indicated here, there is a sharp uh, 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 movement of the, the head to the back. And so everyone said if the head goes to the back, that means the bullet came from the front. And the fact is when you look at the earlier uh, uh, slides, 312 and 313, as subjected to a technical analysis in the 1970s that we did not do and could not have done at the time, in fact, it shows that the president's head did move forward two inches, 2.2 inches uh, when the bullet hit uh, his head. 
Uh, but beyond that, there's all the other evidence we've referred to. There were no eyewitnesses of any second shooter. There were no bullet fragments other than what came from Oswald's rifle. There was no second rifle ever found. There was no third bullet ever found that hit the car, uh, hit Dealey Plaza, hit anywhere in the state of Texas, so far as we know, and no, no fourth cartridge that came from a rifle uh, uh, other than uh, his. This is uh, uh, Agent James Hostie, uh, Hostie whose job it was to bring the FBI file up to date by finding out where Oswald worked and where he, where he lived. Uh, and in that course, he interviewed uh, Ruth Payne on two occasions, November 1 and on November 5. When he went to the Payne residence on November 5, he met Marina Oswald for the first time. He was very gentle in dealing with her uh, 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 and tried to assure her that he was not the same kind of person as the KGB. Uh, but in any event, Oswald was so offended by this agent talking to his wife uh, uh, that he delivered a, a, a unsealed envelope to the FBI office within the, the next week or 10 days. And I can't tell you exactly what the note said because it was burned on direction from the head of the FBI office on Sunday the 24th of November after Oswald was killed by Ruby. This came to light in 1975 and there was testimony uh, first from the, 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 the receptionist who received this note from this uh, surly uh, young man addressed to Agent uh, Hostie. And she took a broad range of her uh, duty assignments and she opened the envelope. Uh, and, and she testified uh, before Congress that it read, let this be a warning, I will blow up the FBI and the Dallas Police Department if you don't stop bothering my wife, signed Lee Harvey Oswald. Now Ho Hostie testified somewhat differently. He said it was unsigned, he did not read it at all until after the assassination of, uh, of the president. And uh, Hostie testified, it was not signed, it said, if you have anything you want to learn about me, come talk to me directly. If you don't cease bothering my wife, I will take appropriate action and report to the proper authorities. Now, upon not too much serious consideration, it seemed to me that there was, given what we know about Lee Harvey Oswald and his proclivity for announcing his, his uniqueness, uh, I, I, I do think uh, that the receptionist was closer uh, to the truth, and, I, and, and, and this does lead to two uh, significant uh, conclusions. Uh, first, and very important, given some of the recent articles and books that have been written, no one who understands this story and that Oswald, 10 days or so before the assassination, wrote a threatening note to law enforcement in Dallas can seriously believe that he had the intention at that time either alone or as a member of a conspiracy to kill the president. I mean, no one would be that stupid, and he was not stupid. And so uh, I, I suggest to you that this is clear evidence that he was not part uh, of, uh, of a conspiracy and that the reasons he developed for killing the president uh, were would be found within his, his background, his life, his aspirations, uh, and the way he wanted to be uh, 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 remembered. The second conclusion is that if Hostie had done what his job called for and went out to interview uh, Oswald, there would have been no assassination. Thank you. I'll be glad to. Uh, I know I've overstepped my time, and I can claim it was technical difficulties that forced me to do that. Uh, but that would not be completely true. Uh, I'm, I'd be very receptive to questions. I'd love to have questions. So if there's conspiracy theorists in the group, please let me hear from you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, there's someone back here. Okay. I was very interested in your reaction to Governor Connolly's testimony and also how the uh, commission uh, if I'm characterizing it incorrectly, please do so. Watered down uh, or compromised in terms, in out deference to Connolly in pursuit of unanimity, the commission produced a compromise statement on the single bullet question. Obviously, Connolly has, at least in video that I've seen, remained strong in regard to that. Was there any effort uh, in questioning? I guess part of it is just asking about questioning style to say, Governor Connolly, have you considered that in the moment of that you might be mistaken? Uh, was that kind of nudge ever part of, uh, of dealing with witnesses? Yeah, well, if the staff had had the opportunity, it would have been more than a nudge. Uh, 
I mean, Governor Connolly, uh, you know, was the governor of Texas. Damn it, he wanted his own bullet. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and in fact, there are, there are rumors that at various points later in life, he might have conceded some flexibility, but I think your reading is more correct, that he did stick with it. And in fact, it, it's not, as the, uh, the discussion has continued, it's completely, the single bullet there is completely consistent with his recollection, which said he heard a shot, and then he turned around, and he was shot. Now, and so as I've said, the consensus is that the first shot did miss, so he turned around. So the only, the only real question is, well, how did he get wounded then, you know, if the first shot missed, and there was no bullet that, that him, uh, hit him fresh, so to speak? And, and, and that's why, again, the question is what happened to the bullet when it came out of, of, the, of the president's throat. So, I think there was a majority of the commission knew that the facts and the expertise supported the single bullet theory. At the time, we all disagreed with the, the uh, Chief Justice's desire to purchase unanimity at the cost of, shall we say, a confused effort to deal with the issue. Uh, it, uh, there were at least two and maybe three members of the commission that did not want to offend Governor Connolly. Now, most of the write-up you know, indicates that, in fact, the single bullet theory has been accepted by all the experts who looked at it, including 19 pathologists over the years. There's only one who still dissents from it. He's going to be featured at the conspiracy convention uh, this coming weekend. Uh, but the, uh, so Governor Connolly just could not be, could not be per per persuaded. And even though, as is clear from the medical testimony and the wound examination, that his wound would have been more extensive and serious if it had been a pristine bullet. Uh, so even, you know, he didn't even want <laughs> to, you know, to say that he was in good fortune because the president had been wounded in advance. In any event, there were nudges, there were efforts, there were complaints. We have to live with what was done. And in retrospect, I can see why the Chief Justice valued unanimity, because if he'd handed President Johnson a report from which two or three members dissented because they didn't want to insult Governor Connolly, what would President Johnson have to do? And how would Governor Connolly have reacted? And how would the public have reacted to what would have then been a highly divided commission on a critical, critical issue? So uh, in retrospect, uh, you know, I can see why he, the Chief Justice did what he did, and it may have been the wisest of decisions. And if I can, as a quick follow-up, one of the things, I, unless I missed it in your book, that he, um, a lot of the critics of the single bullet theory talk about that that bullet cannot do as much as it did, Kennedy and Connolly, and, and, and still be yeah. in that good of a condition. I, you adequately, I think, talk about the trajectory is possible from Kennedy to Connolly, but I don't remember you addressing or answering the argument that that bullet after doing all of that should not look like it did. Well, right, that, that, that's fair. One of the problems with that, and, and a problem that I uh, contribute to, is that the, the picture of that bullet uh, in my book, and it's commonly used in exhibits, doesn't show where the missing grains are. They're from the end, not from the body of the bullet seen from the side. And, and they, there were sufficient grains missing from that bullet, about three grains, that could account uh, for all the wounds. Now, something that's been discovered, although it's, it's con this is controversial, is that there were grains, allegedly, of this bullet found in Governor Connolly's wrist. Now, that's been faulted and, uh, by some of the critics, and it may be the technology isn't good enough today, to, or then certainly, to prove that. But the point is there were f fragments in the wrist, and, 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 and some effort has been made to link those uh, grains to this bullet. But the more important response to you is there were sufficient grains missing from that bullet uh, that were found elsewhere uh, uh, to permit the bullet to cre cre uh, create the damage it did. And, and principally it's because it didn't hit, it didn't hit strong muscles or bones uh, in, in traversing uh, uh, the president's back, neck, and then uh, the parts of uh, Connolly's body that it impacted. But you're right, that's one of the, the major issues. That, that's the answer. And you know, one has to say, well, if it wasn't that bullet, what was it? Where was the bullet? You know, what, they still have to answer the question, what happened to the bullet when it left the president? And they have to answer the question, there's no evidence of a third bullet that hit Connolly you know, as in a pristine form. So the problem with the conspiracy theories generalists, generally, is that they pick on something like this and say, 
therefore, your, your, your report is trash. It's wrong. Uh, you didn't accommodate this. And they haven't thought through the implications of the point that they're making. Thank you. There, what, you uh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> all right, by all means, then you ought to go home. All right. <laughs> well, there's someone running for the. Um, I'm sorry, but I, um, thank you. This was very interesting. I loved being here. Um, I, I forgot to see on the list, or I forget now, whether or not Jackie Kennedy was called as one of the witnesses. And then also, what lessons have been learned by any of the um, Secret Service right now based on what you saw happening actually immediately in Dallas by handling of the Dallas police, the Texas police, as opposed to federal officials? Well, the, yes, the Jack, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy uh, was uh, uh, interviewed by the, the, the Chief Justice uh, with Jay Lee Rankin present and with the Robert Kennedy present in her apartment. And it was uh, um, uh, very offensive to the staff, the staff members who had prepared 120 questions to ask her. Uh, and I had cut down, I took the privilege of cutting down the questions to about 40 or 50. And I discussed this with the Attorney General uh, and the Deputy Attorney General. And the decision was to have her interviewed under these circumstances by the Chief Justice. And uh, so, so there's been a lot of, there, there was internal staff uh, opposition to that very strong view that she should have been handled with not so gingerly. But if you read the testimony, uh, and in fact, someone deleted a few, a few words, but her testimony in a paragraph basically says all she can remember. And, and once you've heard about pieces of uh, her husband's brain falling all over her and see her stained coat, and she doesn't remember it crawling off the back of, of the car uh, for whatever reason she was doing, and so, you know, you can read that as a human being and say, uh, that's enough. But, you know, prosecutors are prosecutors, and it may be that a different set of investigators in a different time uh, 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 would have pressed her more fully. But it's my judgment that there wasn't much more she could recall that would have been of any significance to our investigation. I mean, it was, this was not the job of the Warren Commission to, you know, report people's innermost feelings at the moments of tragedy in their personal, personal life. But, that may be an old-fashioned view, too. Uh, as to the Secret Service, I can say nothing uh, very, that's very informed or useful. Uh, I, I, I see what they have done, and now that they're part of the Homeland Security, I think trying to put 27 different agencies under the, a single federal department, based on my limited experience in government, is, is not going to produce more efficient management. And, and each of those departments is still regarding itself as has different, different traditions, different training, uh, uh, different weapons, different rules. And, and it may be that the, they got a little bit more money as a result of our work. Uh, but whether the culture's changed, it would seem from some evidence that it hasn't changed. But now a woman's in charge. So we can expect miracles uh, in, 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 in the near term. Uh, let's hope so. Yes, sir. OK, I've got a two-part question. Um, first of all, can you speak to the, um, I guess it was the 2% uh, referenced in your book about the evidence that didn't make it into the Warren Report? And then can you also talk about um, the sealed documents from President Kennedy that are still sealed? And the, what's the purpose behind that? And what's, what's the, uh, the long-term? No, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, uh, the 2%, the, the well, uh, the Chief Justice uh, took a step that I just learned about, actually, when I was researching this book. In January of 1965, he learned that the National Archives was not doing what the Commission wanted uh, the archives to do, and that was to process all the materials that the Commission generated and provided to archives and get them into the public domain as quickly as possible. And the archives was not doing that because they had a practice of not uh, producing any investigative reports from the FBI or any other agency uh, uh, without approval of the investigative agencies. And so, uh, once the Supreme, uh, once the Justice, uh, Chief Justice talked to the President, the President, President Johnson issued an order directing archives to depart from their customary practice and start processing Warren Commission documents. So by the time of the hearings in 1992, when the uh, uh, JFK Records Production Act was passed, and the hearing at which I testify, there were only 2% of the Warren Commission materials which were not in the public domain. 
And those were all allegedly national security documents. The real problem of disclosure was that the House Select Committee had not disclosed any of their records since their 1977-78 investigation. So there were, were tens of thousands uh, of documents from, generated by that investigation, and so it needed a federal law to get those to be disclosed. About what's being still withheld under the, the Act, nothing can be held beyond 2017 unless the President personally says the national interest justifies retention. I hear there are about 2,000 documents overall that are still not available. I see no reason for that. I mean, the only, uh, I, I wish they all had been made available earlier. The only serious uh, concern I can see, and, and it becomes less persuasive as the years pass, is that some of these protected documents may reveal names of informants who still have families that might be subjected to retribution if the names were advanced. In other words, there may be some legitimate intelligence interest, but I think it's so difficult to conjure them up at this time that I think that a general policy releasing everything uh, it would be the preferred policy now. But you know, even if everything were produced now, people are still gonna say, well, there's some being withheld. I mean, there's never gonna be a level of confidence, you know, unfortunately, that you know, what the government says is gonna be accepted as, as true on a matter of, of, of this importance and sensitivity. No. Sir. Yes, Mr. Willens, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk, and thank you very much for writing your book. Um, and thank you for your service on the Warren Commission. Uh, I'm personally a, a strong believer in the lone assassin conclusion and I'm a great admirer of the Warren Commission. Um, one of the aspects of the investigation which remains a bit mysterious uh, to this day is perhaps the motivation of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, the commission was so busy uh, dealing with the enormous number of, of factual questions that the motivation may have been uh, set to one side. And in my own research into the event, I've come to the conclusion that there was quite a strong copycat factor in Oswald's act based on, in particular, on two movies, two films that he was exposed to, massively exposed to. The first film, uh, many of you may know it here in the audience, was The Manchurian Candidate. It came out in 1962. It involves a presidential assassination with a rifle. And that film actually played in a movie theater in Dallas, just 14 blocks away from Dealey Plaza. It can't be proven that Oswald saw it, but he was certainly massively aware of it. The movie played for two months in Dallas in late 1962. There was another movie that was shown on television in October 1963. It was called We Were Strangers. And again, it's a presidential assassination movie. And the assassins are heroes, they're leftist heroes uh, fighting for the freedom of Cuba. And it's known perfectly well that Oswald saw this film. And um, it just seems to me that he saw that just a week or two after he learned that Kennedy, President Kennedy, would be coming to Dallas. And, uh, and then just two or three days after seeing the film, by chance, he got a job in downtown Dallas. And the, uh, the ingredients are there. What we know now after 40, 50 years of, of uh, many, many copycat cases in the newspapers are that, is that young men especially, they are very influenced by the media. So I wonder if you could just uh, uh, offer your view on that subject. Well, I think, that, I think that's, that's very, very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I think if our, our view today is that young, young white men in particular, you know, are very susceptible to uh, schizophrenia and uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, Oswald may have been a person who didn't hear voices, perhaps, but was disturbed in a way that motivated this. Uh, he did have a reading 
He, he was an extensive reader, read many books uh, involving spies and killing as well. Uh, I, I think there, the, we did have three psychiatrists sit down with us and uh, review everything that he wrote and talk about uh, the factors in his life, his upbringing, his moving, his, his very uh, possessive uh, 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 mother, uh, his alienation to no male in his life, uh, uh, and uh, his truancy uh, as a youngster in New York City, uh, his sense of isolation and uh, insignificance, uh, all, all of which uh, may have contributed to this desire that he had to demonstrate in some uh, dramatic and, and way that he was what he thought he was, an extraordinary human being who could reshape uh, history. Uh, uh, Bugliosi uh, uh, addresses the, the, the motivation problem in a, uh, uh, an interesting way. Uh, he points out that Oswald really uh, respected President Kennedy. We all knew that at the commission time from uh, his wife. Uh, so why kill a, uh, try to kill a fascist, General Walker, on the one hand, and then uh, try to kill President Kennedy, you know, a, a, a liberal uh, uh, president, uh, on the other hand, and Bugliosi looks at the, uh, the fact in, in Oswald's uh, diary that he basically uh, has equal fault, finds equal faults in, with capitalism and with communism, and that he feels there has to be some new form of government, and that a representative of either form of government uh, is to hear him a symbol of that government which he detests, and he detests the United States. And so Bugliosi suggests that use of the word representative suggests that to Oswald, President Kennedy, however nice or idealistic he was, was a representative of the United States, which he thoroughly detested. There are others who focus on the events just three days in, before, uh, before the assassination, where he had a serious dispute with his wife about his using a false name to get a rooming house in Dallas. He wanted to make overtures. He invited her to move uh, with her, her and the children to a house in, in Dallas to live together as a family, and she turned him down. Uh, and the next day, he, he asked Mr. Fraser to drive him home early so he can get the rifle for Friday. So I have no firmer answer. I, I think you know, you're, you're absolutely right. He, he was aware of some of that. He heard Walker speak, too, and he told his wife that uh, as far as he was concerned, if, if Hitler had been shot, it would have spared people a lot of uh, 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 hurt and, and the, the Holocaust and so forth. Yes, ma'am. You spoke to this already, but I didn't quite understand your answer. In the Oliver Stone movie, they showed repeatedly the, the film, and they showed his back and to the left, back, back and to the left, and they repeated that. And you had said something about the way the film was, that it's, your film said his head went forward. So I didn't quite understand that answer or how it could be both or if it was the film was wrong or well yeah could you the, clarify the, that sure the, the the firm obviously is what the firm is it's neither wrong or right it's what you take away from it and in fact both things are correct i'm sorry i went over that i think too quickly uh, in, in in fact the uh, uh what uh, the the close examination of the film in the middle 1970s demonstrated that when the bullet, looking at uh, frames 312 and 313, 313 being the film where the head uh, is shown to be shattered, uh, the, you can look at those two uh, uh, frames under exam, close examination of the original frames from this Bruder film and determine that the head did move forward 2.2 inches. Then, in the succeeding five firms, there was a neuromuscular reaction when the second bullet hit the, his spinal cord and his nervous system, and it jerked the head back strongly. It lasted for five, for five uh, uh, frames. So it's the going backwards that people said it had to be uh, from the front. Uh, uh, the, the, the wound evidence suggests that it couldn't have come from the, the front because the injury would have been uh, entirely different. So, that's what I'm saying, that in fact it proved the head did go forward. And what people don't realize is that a bullet is really a very light uh, 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 instrument, even if it's moving at a considerable velocity, and that uh, uh, in fact a, a, a shot from the front would not have produced the significant movement that's reflected in those five frames. So that may be more than you wanted to know, but that, that, that's sort of a, a where it comes out. Thank you.
a little bit on a different. <laughs> Okay. A, li a little bit on a different theme. Could you just talk a little bit about what it was like to have such an important position at such a young age and what it's meant for your career and aspirations since then? <laughs> <laughs> you were incredibly young. How, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, let's put it this way. It was an extraordinary assignment. Uh, uh, I, I did my best, uh, and I worked with a, a very... Uh, a uh, talented group of uh, people that has produced uh, senators and judges and uh, law professors and deans of law schools and otherwise uh, very successful, uh, successful people and indeed the president. Uh, uh, but I went back to my duties and uh, uh, in the law business, at least in my experience, you sort of move on. And uh, I took on other assignments uh, in the rest of my career that uh, were never quite as uh, prominent as this perhaps, but uh, carried different kinds of challenges. and. Uh, I had a lot of fun and worked with some talented people. And uh, uh, I'm married to a woman who's a lawyer who wanted to retire and do different things uh, uh, just uh, at a very young age. Uh, so we're still doing that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you.